Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Bogey Proof. We got the two stalwarts here, Matt and Mike, holding down the fort. Joey and Eric couldn't make it, so they just passed along their picks for the week. Eric might pop in, so if you hear a voice at some point, that's him just, <laughs> you know, squeaking the door and, and opening up on us. But Matt, where are you coming from and what are you sipping on tonight? Yep, still in Connecticut, you know, working. Got a nice workout in today. Weather's finally coming around. Got some golf golf planned for this upcoming weekend, so looking forward to that. Um, and I'm sipping on Western Mass people will know a little treehouse tonight. Uh, my parents went, I want to say, maybe two weeks ago now. Uh, they went, they had like a doctor's appointment in Worcester or something, picks them up on the way home. Delicious. One of my favorite IPAs. It's a you know, local Western Mass thing. I think they're out in Charlton now, which I guess is more central mass, but started in Munson, Mass. So shout out to Treehouse. Good stuff here. Uh, what are you sipping on them? Let the people know where you're calling them from. Yeah. And quickly to kind of close loop on Treehouse. Did you see that they're they're closing in on a, a tap room out on the Cape? With Oh, cool, yes, I did hear about that. Some cool views out there. So I know the one of the owners was going in front of the you know, the town board or whatever to get that approved here this week. So hopefully that's the case. I think, you know, Treehouse is relatively well known and in, in Massachusetts and kind of in the beer community, but would definitely be kind of fun to introduce more people. And I think that would, you know, having a place like the Cape where people come from all over the world really yeah. to visit would be cool and could give them some, some nice exposure, but I'm down here in Pinehurst week number two of a, of a nice little stretch I got going um been playing a bunch of golf hitting golf balls in the morning going to the gym we got a we got a nice little regiment going and i am sipping on a on a guinness oh. nitro cold brew right whoa, now whoa. so it's uh essentially just a, a guinness with a little nitro cold brew in there and it is absolutely fantastic actually I, yeah. I like guinness in general but then just kind of like the the coffee flavor to yeah. kind of kick you in the butt a little bit and kind of cut through sometimes like sometimes Guinness has like a tough aftertaste I think yeah. especially if you don't get like a perfect one or a fresh one but yeah. the coffee kind of is cut cutting through it a little bit so it is it is mighty tasty and I'm ex I'm excited for uh for the other three in this I don't think I'm gonna be able to do you know more than one a night yeah, no. but uh definitely definitely looking forward to to this and I got a nice little kind of repertoire of sorts right now with like some different southern pines ipas and some good local beers i still got a few of those um peach ales from the uh, highland brewing out in, in Asheville for that i kind of got for the masters last week so kind of developing a nice little portfolio down here some good beers and i am fully back on a, a beer kick right now there's something about warm weather cool. green grass and like that just makes you kind of want to sip on a beer if you have nothing going on um so definitely fully back on that. Haven't had too much bourbon, which is kind of sacrilegious being in the South right now, but we'll, we'll get back to that as soon as possible as well. But give us, Matt, let's just jump right into kind of a master's recap. What's, what kind of caught your eye? Let's not get into individual players right now, but maybe just overall course or kind of the experience of the 2021 masters. Um, how'd that go for you? Amazing as always, you know, right. Augusta's got <clears throat> all the traditions, the, the views, the the drama it creates on that back nine, the, uh, everything about it. It was so awesome having it back in April and seeing it play a little more true to, you know, challenging the players, I guess. I mean, don't, Augusta was beautiful and it was awesome to be able to have a Masters last year, all things considered. So, like, not trying to shit on the November Masters at all, but April is just where it belongs. It just – the course plays more appropriate. It challenges the players a lot more. Um, it just – plays true to how it was designed I think and it was just we've got the we finally got like the firm and fastness that we've kind of been hoping for in the you know I feel like that's always the topic talked about with majors and that's what made like Bay Hill this year so fun to watch with seeing that basically burnt out for the weekend um I just love seeing Augusta firm and fast like that just it, it just it takes I don't know every year it's just there's you're surprised by it even though you know it like it doesn't change right you know all the whole locations before they even play the round like all that kind of stuff like they keep it the same it's just every year kind of takes your breath away yeah no for sure i i'm very much in the in the same categories we're lucky enough to to watch a lot of the masters this year and you know just i mean shout out to the masters for a spectacular app i you know oh, yeah. just you know a 
a working person's dream to kind of be able just to have that app on in the in the background on on Thursday and Friday and the fact that when you click on someone someone's scorecard and then it goes directly to the last shot they hit and you can like I mean I definitely found myself Thursday evening you know watching back in a couple entire rounds and you know it takes like 10 minutes to watch someone's entire round yeah. I mean, that's, that's great. That's, you know, so definitely, you know, we wish the PGA tour could, could have something similar like that, but um, obviously the masters just pulls out all the stops. Um, so, you know, it makes sense that they have this, this sort of app, um, but it's, uh, it definitely sucks that we only get it once a year, but yeah, I just, you know, I loved kind of where we fell to. And I, I think where we finished, like, Matsuyama is what 10 under or 10 under. I think 10 under is just like such a sweet spot for, for Augusta national. Like it just kind of shows, Hey, if you're under par every single day and you're, and you're pushing forward, like you have an opportunity on Sunday afternoon, which kind of what it came down to. So I think I loved where the score kind of ended up. And I don't know if it was just, you know, TV cameras have gotten better or what, but I feel like this was the first time I saw a little Brown in the greens at Augusta. Yeah. As, as much as it's been firm in the past, I just thought like we saw some, we saw some Brown and I think Kevin Kisner talked about it on Thursday afternoon. Like it was kind of a guessing game, right? Like you could hit a hard spot and it would, you know, it would bounce 10 or 15 feet before it started to spin. If you hit a soft spot then, right. And you know, some people might take that as, Oh, the course isn't like, you know, it's not true. Like, you know, you should get the same bounce here, but, but, that's really not the way golf's played for, for 99% of the courses out there, right? Like it's uneven. It's, you know, you're going to get a, a bounce here or there. So uh, loved Kisner's kind of interpretation on Thursday afternoon and definitely set the, set the tone for what we were going to have the, the remainder of, of the weekend and, and loved how resilient the golf course was too, after we got yeah. that rain on, on Saturday afternoon, right. It, it really challenged people. Um, to kind of readjust to the speed of the greens, but we still, we still found that firmness in the greens. And I mean, there's nothing more difficult than trying to figure out, Hey, it just rained. Is this green slower or, you know, but it's still a firm green. So when I'm hitting a pitch shot here, like, how is it going to react? Like, so I think all those variables that came in made for kind of some great drama, um, you know, and also just shout out to Jim Nance and Vern Lundquist, two of the best in the game. Like, Jim Nance, does the guy have the greatest life of all time? Lives yeah. at Pebble Beach, nice. and his you know end of March through the middle of April is March Madness, and then the Masters. Like those are, I mean, those in my opinion, the Masters is the greatest golf event of the year, and March Madness is the the best sporting event. Period. Yeah. Um, so like, this is, this is my favorite time of year to watch sports and, and Jim Nance is just like in the middle and creating the drama even more. So, um, what, what are your thoughts on Vern Lundquist? So I know we were kind of chatting a little bit before, but the guy's a stud, like yeah, 16 he, I mean, he's got, you know, one of the most memorable calls ever at Augusta with tigers chipping on 16. He's always got that 16th hole on the weekends, perched up in his little tower, just watching the shots come in. And I, I like Vern because he's, you know, he's been doing it for a long time now. He's getting a little older. So some of the names get a little mixed up sometimes, but like he doesn't apologize for it. He just rolls with it. You know, like it's the, you can tell he's just, it's just authentic. It's just, he's just sitting there watching golf and you're getting what he's seeing. Like, it's just very blunt. And like, I feel like now so many people try and get in like with PGA Tour Live with all these different ways you can watch golf. So many different people get an opportunity to try and do broadcasting right in whatever way it is and it's like it's so much harder than it looks I think people try so hard and kind of get in their own way and it just comes off as so unnatural and you can just tell you're you're hitting like certain key points that the you know producers whatever wants you to talk about but Vern like I feel like he's just sitting up there he's got his list of who's coming through the hole or he's got his screen up whatever he does it up there and he's just like, oh, here comes a shot. Oh, and it hits on top of the ridge, and here it comes rolling. Like it's just like so, like yeah, it's just like, what it is, you know. And like, he, and then he, he has into motion as it gets closer or whatever away from the hole. Like he's just like blunts the wrong word, but he's just it's very just simple and straightforward. And it like he's not churching it up. Like it's just no. here's the golf, you know. And it, and it is funny. He adds a little, like he adds commentary to it. Like it just comes off funny, and I don't think he's trying to be funny, you know. Yeah. Like Vern, Vern is most certainly not like 
in the press meeting at to start the day. Like, you mm-hmm. know, like, you know, he's rolling like, you know, the lead or the leaders when, when he's on the call at 16 or it's not till, you know, six o'clock at night. And he really probably doesn't have to be there until early afternoon. You know, he's rolling in with a coffee, like he gets his one or two notes and he, you know, like you say, he sits up there and his, his perch on 16 and he, and he does his thing. And, you know, people probably in the background kind of question him and, you know, kind of talk behind his back is like, Hey, kind of fucked that up or whatever the case may be. But like, cares just the, yeah. And the way he can articulate us, like he just does such an interesting, he can articulate a story on a, on a hole that takes, you know, seven seconds from the time (laughs) the ball is hit to stopping on the green, which is just super cool. And, you know, hopefully we get Vern Lundquist for, for another period of time. And and Jim Nance always does a, a great job, both, you know, in the, in the commentary and the play-by-play kind of while it's going on, but then also, um, you know, Butler cabin and, and all that at the end too, as well. But speaking of, of Butler cabin, so we didn't have any amateurs that made the, that made the cut this year. So that was a little bit interesting. And, you know, they spoke on it a little bit. It was, it was tough. We only had three this year, Um, you know, no mid am. So I, you know, I'm not going to read too much into that. I think amateurs are a big part of Augusta and that most certainly is not going anywhere. And hopefully kind of in the coming years, we'll, we'll get a couple more studs and, you know, a U.S. amateur who, you know, plays well in the masters as an amateur and then comes back kind of like Hideki did when, you know, he won the Asian amateur and, and now he's a master's champion. What was your take on, on Hideki this weekend, kind of his overall game and, and kind of what that, what that win meant for golf, I would say as a whole. Yeah, I think, I think I, I love that the fact that the like he won the am in 2011 comes back 10 years I mean he was there the whole time but 10 years later puts the jacket and I think that's really cool and like just to add to the amateur thing like they didn't have the international ams this year like that Asia Pacific one that Augusta like sponsors like they set that stuff up to be able to bring in the amateurs so just due to all the COVID stuff they couldn't have those sermons past you know last year or whatever so it kind of stinks to, to like you said there's only three I think normally there's like eight at least amateurs mm-hmm. in there so just tough that, you know, you didn't have an amateur in there to be part of that, you know, Butler cabin ceremony. The only thing I'll say about the Butler cabin thing is like, you do it at a weird time. Like you do it when coverage starts and like, that's the middle of the round, you know, like it's like Hideki's on, I feel like they did it when he was on like 11, like going through Amen corner, they, they switch over to Faldo and Nance in there real quick. And it's like, I get, they're trying to build up like, you know, the moment and the, the history and do all that stuff. But like, there's got to be a better time for it. Like, I feel like they do it, like, do it on Saturday. Like, I don't know. Like, it just, like, we you miss golf shots, right? I mean, like, to go back to the app, like, there's stuff that came out this week, you know, the, whether it was yesterday or today, that, you know, ratings were way down for the Masters and all that stuff. And it's like, it's because the app is better than watching the coverage. You know what I'm saying? Like, the fact that the Masters, you know, it is all this stuff that we've talked about for two weeks now everybody in the world watches like especially now with you know our this year's winter being in japan like this is going to be it's it's, just, it's an international event right the fact that we get the same amount of pri- like tv coverage for it that we get every week of just that three to seven three to seven saturday it gets you know a little longer and then sundays at two to seven to whatever it finishes but like and i know they do live from the masters and all that stuff's pretty cool throughout the week to be talking the storylines you get a little glimpse of them on the range they show highlights here and there but the fact that come thursday morning when the leader the first groups go off at 7 8 a.m whatever it is the fact that you can't find that golf unless you go through the app which is probably on purpose right if you're augusta but like it just is i find it so weird that majors there's not coverage you know obviously it's not going to take up you can't have espn the whole day i get that but like have it on golf channel. Like, yeah, but, like, but right, Matt, we got, we got ESPN. What was it? ESPN plus when the PGA was on, like how, how do we not get that sort of scenario at the masters? Yeah. Right. They, we, we could watch almost every shot at the, at the PGA in San yeah, Francisco yeah, yeah. last, last fall. Like Starting I think, yep. you know, and, and I don't know. And I think you kind of spoke to it, right. Like Augusta is probably controlling a lot of those channels and, and, you know, they probably wouldn't allow that, but I think we have to find a way to, for that to, that to become the norm in a major championship. Like I yeah. think Augusta special, but right. The PGA coming up, like I want to see every shot that 
at Kiowa if I yeah, if too. I can, but right like Thursday afternoon to Thursday morning tells me a lot about what's going to happen on Sunday afternoon, right? Mm-hmm. So like I I think it's it's a little criminal that we don't get to see all those shots at, yeah. or at least have the opportunity to. Um, and, unless you're like you know we're obviously very serious golf fans, so we have the app Monday of Masters week. We're right at roll. Not everybody does that. Like the casual golf fan, like they're not downloading the app, going on masters.com Thursday morning at 8 a.m., pulling up the four screens and like doing all that stuff. Like, like I don't get me wrong. I watched all the golf. I got to see every shot I wanted to see. I'm just saying like for the general public, like they say ratings are down. It's like, well, because they don't give you an option to watch it, except for in these primetime blocks. And it's like, to your point too, like if we can't watch till Thursday afternoon at three o'clock, you miss the whole morning wave. And what if, you know, Colin Morikawa, Rory McIlroy, DJ, you know, all these guys, Wills Torres, Spieth, Shoffley, all these top name guys that people want to watch. If they're in the morning wave on Thursday, they're just simply not going to watch Thursday afternoon. They'll watch Friday afternoon when they're on the golf court, you know, because it always flip flops. But like you're sacrificing. It's just I just. I understand, like, you know, they always say TV contracts, blah, 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 whatever normal week totally get it only the crazy golf fans are craving for the thursday morning at rbc heritage i get that and they can get it through pga tour live or whatever but for majors like i need golf when golf is being played like give me a way to watch it i don't know it's just you have the res. like i feel like there's no way they don't have the resources right like f- like and again the masters gives you that option through their app and you're able to do it that way it's just just find it crazy that like and like i think you know this is kind of shout out to joey he brought this up but it's like he's like i want to watch golf right now and it was like you know 11 a.m on sunday when like jordan and those guys were going out ahead of time and like eric's like it's on the app he's like i know but like you know what i mean you know like classic joey but like (laughs) (laughs) but like i get his point though it's like i should be able to put it on my tv like i shouldn't have to you know get my laptop out hook it into this whatever like all that stuff i think that's just like I mean, no, shout I, out to Augusta for the app, right? But, like, I feel like that's just got – for the majors, you just got to fix that. But, anyways, back to your original question of Hideki here. Um, his play was, I mean, thoroughly impressive ball striking performance. And I think that minus 10 being that final score, like you said, it's a sweet spot because if you're – if you, you know if you're under par – all, all four days, you're going to be in the mix on that back nine Sunday, which is all you can ask for in a major championship. And it also gives you the opportunity to shoot a 74 and not be out of the tournament. Like if you shoot 74 on Thursday in November, you were done. The lead was at eight under after day one, you're 10 shots back. You got to shoot eight under the next day to get back in the mix and like at least five under to make the cut. You know, like it just, it gets away from you so fast when that finishing score is minus 20. Um, but the biggest thing that got me for a decky, I mean, we honestly, we picked him to lose on last week's pod due to his putting, but he had a good enough week with the flat stick and he was actually really solid from like that short range or kind of mid range where he normally struggles. But the thing for me was his chipping. I mean, obviously the back nine Saturday was like perfect golf, but when he didn't have it, he chipped it so well, I feel like on Saturday on 18 that up and down from behind the green was stupid 13 when he started getting a little squirrely after the bogey on 12 rattles it off the trees kind of pulls the five iron into like that long left to 13 which is always sketchy chipping down that hill and chipped it to two inches or whatever like I think his chipping took a lot of pressure off the putter because if he chips that to 12 feet he's not I don't think he makes that 12 footer for birdie on 13 you know so I think he hit the shots when you needed to hit him, and it usually was his around the greens chipping that bailed him out more than the putter did. The putter was good. Like, it was obviously you won the major. You don't putt poorly and win. But the chipping, I think, like, either kept him alive or, like, allowed him to, like, make up for two bad swings on 13 and still make a birdie. Like, that was mm-hmm. big to give one back, get it right back on the next hole versus just start leaking oil on 12 and have to hang on for six holes instead of, like, you know, it, it always feels good to get one back before you start leaking in on the way in. So I think, yeah. I think he just did a really good job throughout the week. I mean, clinical ball striker. He's been one since he came on tour, but I think those yeah. are the things that got him over the hump. I, I think you bring up a, I, I thought 13 was the, the turning point. I know 15 was kind of all over the place and was, it was an exciting hole, but I think 13 him, you know, making the bogey on 12, hitting two, 
below average shots at, for a, for a tour, touring professional on 13 to get that up and down when so many people, Spieth, Zalatoris, three putted for par on Sunday um, on 13 yeah. after, you know, kind of playing the hole properly and getting it on the upper level. And then, then three putting, I think, right. That one shot swing on, on there was the difference, um, you know, and kind of gave him that additional cushion to kind of, you know, bleed a little bit on the way in and, and still get it done. Um, and I, I, I think too, I don't, I don't want to gloss over Saturday afternoon. Like it is, it is difficult to come out after a restart yeah. um, and, and play as well as he did. And, you know, I, I think everyone kind of reacts differently to it, especially like depending on how you played before, like if you're struggling a little bit or kind of just like flatlining, Hey, maybe it's your, you're kicking the ass to get going. Or, um, you know, some, a lot of times, like I've definitely been in circumstances where I've been playing some really good golf and then, you know, you have to stop for the day or whatever. And then you struggle when you come back out. So everyone kind of reacts differently to it. And so, you know, kudos to him for being able to, to turn it on and take advantage of softer conditions, those last um, 10 holes that when he came out and played. And I just think it, it kind of speaks to, you know, it, it speaks to how good the tour players are, right? Like they, they can flip that switch and go from kind of just like making ho hum pars to making, you know, seven birdies and 10 holes in a heartbeat. Um, so, you know, especially in a week like this where, where 10 under got it done, it was really kind of like he played good golf all week long and then just had the best nine holes of anybody all week. So, you know, and, and that was the difference. And that's why he's the master's champion because, you know, when the opportunity presented itself and the conditions were there, he took it low. And then besides that, he avoided the big number. You know, we chatted about it a little bit before, um, you know, we'll get into it when we talk with about Jordan and, and Xander a little bit later, but like he played well and he played solid when he didn't have his best, you know, he, he hit middle, middle of the greens, he made pars, he got it up and down when he missed greens and, you know, kind of all equated to, to winning the golf tournament. So um, I think we can all kind of learn a little bit from that too. Like, right. Like you're not always going to have your best stuff or you're not always going to have your perfect thing. Like, you kind of got to hang in there when you're making a bunch of parts or making a couple of bogeys and hang in there because it's coming. If you put the work in and you know, you know, you're capable of, of having a stretch like that, like every scratch golfer is, is capable of going out there and making five or six birdies on a, on a nine hole stretch. Um, yeah. Kind of just got to hang in there and make it happen. And for kind of people newer to the golf game, like if you're making bogeys and doubles, like, your, your time is coming when you're going to make four or five pars in a row and have some looks at birdies and things like that. You kind of just got to put your head down and, and, you know, do the best you can to kind of flatline it and make sure those big numbers don't happen. And then, you know, when the opportunity does come strike on it. So, but let's, let's talk a little bit more too about kind of three other people that finished, you know, Will Zalatoris, big Willie Z as we've been referring to him for the last week, um, you know, which is funny because he's probably, six 135 pounds unbelievably um, skinny it's crazy <laughs> jordan jordan spieth and then xander shoffley were, were tied for third as well but dive into to will zelatoris and in kind of up to 27th in the world which is absolutely crazy a guy who didn't even have a corn fairy card um you know 15 months ago and now has two top tens in a major and you know <laughs> is one of the elite uh, professional golfers on the planet right now. So kind of what, what was your take on him this weekend and, and what do you, what do he show you as far as like, you know, what type of player he really is? Yeah. I mean, like you said, six, one, like one thirty five. I think he could wear his whoop as a belt. I think I saw on Twitter at some point if he really wanted to. Um, but just, I mean, world-class ball striker. I mean, like high hits it super high and like super straight like not a lot of curve He's, in it I mean, he stands close to it i know it gets bur like that ball like i don't know if it like i don't know if i just don't notice it when on normal pro tracers but it seemed like he was hitting pop-up drives they were going so high and again it could be some kind of el the elevation of augusta playing with me there or maybe it's the yellow tracer i don't know but watching his pro tracer drives like oh my god he popped that up and it's like 317 in the air up the hill on five i'm like oh all right you got you got all that i guess um just like like you said the rise to the top has been incredible he's been playing awesome golf the last four months six months i mean awesome on the corner for you but on the pga tour like six months he's been 
a top 20 machine, it seems like, with and then top 10 at uh, the wing foot last year. He had the top 10, and then T6, yep. Yep, and then obviously set solo second here at Augusta, which is incredible, especially being his first time, right? Um, the ball striking, uh, yeah, I can't say enough. The ball striking was just ridiculous. He had complete control of his golf ball, hits it high, hits it hard, hits it like it lands soft, like just a really, really good golf swing. It doesn't look like he's doing anything too crazy with it where it seems super repeatable. The one thing that I think ended up costing him is the, the putter. Uh, he had, I want to say, four three putts on the weekend. He had two on Sunday. Um, and even some other ones that weren't three putts, he's out of them kind of quickly on the short, like the inside 10 footers. He's already got like the left lock in left arm going, the claw going. He's got like there's a lot going on with the putting stroke for him. I mean, obviously, you know, he's 27th in the world. They're talking all this good stuff about him. He knows what he's doing out there. But there seems to be a little bit of demons there, um, which I hope like, you know, I don't know, just switch it up, like honeymoon phase your way around and like you'll find something that clicks eventually. He's he's 24 like he's not super super young but um he'll figure it out i'm sure it just that was the only thing that i think ended up honestly costing the tournament i mean if you think about it hideki was kind of more at the 12 13 range for i want to say 14 of the 18 holes yesterday and he never really got to 10 but he birdied the first two i think he he missed a short one on three or four he made a couple bogeys on four and five whatever it was and Again, the putter, like I think he three putted. I know he th- was a thirteen. You said, and I think yeah, he had another one on the back too. I feel like it was ten or something. I don't know, but I mean, he ends up losing by one, right? So if he's able to maybe make one more on the front, avoid the three putts on the back, he's in the house at eleven. And now Hideki's got a after that bogey on fifteen, he's got a or now he bogeyed sixteen too. But a- after that bogey on fifteen, he's got to get an even to to win now he's got to par out where that's a very different you know mindset than what he ended up having um after Xander made the six on 16 so it's like he was right there and it just the ball striking was not the problem I think he just missed a few putts on that front nine that he needed to make and um same on the back just a couple here and there that the timing of them too it just seemed like every time Hideki came back he kind of dropped another one with him versus making that putt and then getting closer to him so Really impressive stuff out of him, given it's, I don't know, was it probably his 12th or 13th PGA Tour start period. Um, second major appearance, solo second at the Masters. He'll be back next year with that top 12 get in everywhere. So really impressive stuff out of him. It was just that putter was just just not not good enough on Sunday to kind of, you know, win a major championship. But all things considered, like, really impressive shit out of him. And I think he'll be around for a while with that ball striking. Yeah, no, it's it'll be interesting to see how it kind of plays out and where he where he finishes this year in the in the world golf rankings. Um, I just think he is he's had such a crazy rise, but there's no like signs of of slowing down at the moment. Like he is he is yet to he's missed one cut in like 15, 15 events. And he's got a million top 25s like he is clearly a top 25 player in the world and 27th in the world is is most certainly not a fluke. Um, So looking forward to, to seeing him continue to play. And, you know, he's a young guy. He wants to play every week too. He's playing at RBC this week. So would expect him to, you know, be up by the top um, of that leaderboard as well. But our old friend, Jordan Spieth, (laughs) the guy, the guy has found something. Like I'm not, I'm not sure he's back back because the masters is tough to, like he he's gonna play he's gonna play well at the masters until he's 50 and he might not be able to swing a golf club for those last 10 years um but like he's gonna be that guy that shoots you know like 77 in the masters when he's 50 just like putting the lights out because he knows every putt out there but um you know he's found something to the ability to kind of get it around the fairways, I would say. And then yeah. the iron play is, is streaky. You know, I think he occasionally hits a, uh, hits a poor one, but, um, but his good ones are like really, really good right now. Like his good ones, it's, are like, they have eyes. Yeah. They got eyes. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like you said, he, he has the squirrely one in him still, but the good ones are just so good now where his strokes gained have been off the charts with the irons the last, you know, four months, whatever it was going, or yeah. not three months, yeah, whatever three it was, months, but, yeah. 
the last whatever it is in this you know rise he's kind of made to get his way back it's it's really the iron play i think that's done it for him and the putting has been really good too i think the putting was actually for his, for his standards kind of disappointing this week like he hit plenty of fairways and like i said the irons were pretty solid i think one stupid ass decision on thursday and then just not quite like kind of burning a lot of edges on the weekend and not really making a few in a row like he's you know known for I mean he really didn't make any putts until what was it 17 he made a long one on Mm -hmm. Sunday like I just feel like for him right the way he plays it's he gets in those modes where he makes everything he looks at for you know a six hole stretch and you know whatever and all of a sudden he's you know right at the top of leaderboard and then he kind of ball strikes his way or you know iron plays his way around the golf course to like kind of stay up there and makes enough putts but he just kind of didn't make anything on the weekend. It felt like it because he, yeah. he actually drove it like for his standards, like really well, like he was mm-hmm. playing that cut and just making it work. And then if he had to hit it the other way, I think he went to the three wood more often than not. Um, Cause he's kind of got like that little, you know, five, 10 yard draw pretty automatic with the three wood. But I think he's um, it'll be interesting to see what he does when we get to these other majors this year, right? Like kind of not his, like you said, Augusta is going to be a home game for him basically for till he's 50. It'd be interesting to see what he does at like a Kiowa or yeah. um, when they go back to Tory or whatever it is like, cause that, those don't really fit his game, but if he's back back, he'll find a way to be at the yeah. top of that leaderboard. Cause that's what he did um, for that three year stretch where he was, you know, number one in the world and whatnot. But yeah, Spieth was fun to watch, man. It's just, it always is. He was chipping in all the all over the place. Like he just, every, the second you're like, damn it, all right, I guess like I gotta you know find somebody else to follow like follow and like live and die by, and then oh, he chipped in again. Oh, all right, I'm back. You know, like it just he always keeps you hanging around. I I've never seen I've never seen someone hit the guy hits like thirty yard hooks with his four iron and throws darts. It's crazy. Like, it's like he works I, him, man. <laughs> like he's just he's just working the ball like he's just like 15 like i know it's a little bit of above your feet but 15 excuse me he's just like the guy's hitting 30 yard hooks like to a right pin like it's hooking it the over the line <laughs> yeah and it's just like and i and i don't know if i honestly just think like i don't even know if he truly envisions those shots as much as he just like has a good as a, you know, he's a professional golfer, obviously, but, you know, just has such a tremendous feel for like just the golf swing and like the, yeah. how it reacts, like when it, how the club interacts with the ground and just like, I think his hands are so good too. Like his chipping motion. I wouldn't say it's like, I, I'm not sure I teach someone to chip the way he does always. Like he gets he like a little twirls stab- it before he's done swinging. It's so he kind of oh, gets a little stabby hit. too. He yeah. gets a little stabby, but like, you know, like the way he chipped one in from below the green on 10. I don't know if it was on Friday or something, but it's like, you're dead to rights. You're probably making bogey there. And he just yeah. chips it in. It's like, yeah. you know, and 15 I think, on Thursday, the Eagle, right? <laughs> I mean, granted that I was going in the water if it doesn't hit the stick, but that's Jordan Spieth, man. Like he does that shit. It's like, yeah. uh, he, he's, he's right now with Tiger Woods on the sidelines. He's the needle, you know, like, he is what everybody wants to see, you know, like good or bad, whatever it is. Everybody wants the roller coaster that is a Jordan Spieth round of golf. There's just, there's just something about it. I don't know. And I think we'll, I think we'll find out by July 4th, we will know whether or not he is back back or it's going to be like a horse for the course kind of thing when he's able to win. Mm-hmm. Cause I think over the next two months, he's going to see courses that aren't really, you know, his speed or, you know, fit his game perfectly where he's going to have to play a little out of his comfort zone and then really see if he's still, he's going to have to do it in ways that maybe don't, you know, work for him. You know, he's going to have to do it a couple different ways, which will be able to, you know, isolate whether or not he's like all the way back or um, if it's just, you know, he'll be back when he gets the right course for him kind of thing. Um, Next though, Xander Shoffley. Before we kind of harp on the bad, I think it was really good to see him back in the mix. I think since it was a waste management that he should have won or whatever when he was in, you know, in the hunt on the weekend and didn't end up getting it done, like kind of threw it away to Brooks or whatever it was. Like he's kind of been quiet since then to his standards. I mean, he's a top five, maybe top eight player in the world. Um, 
And I think it's just his major record is ridiculous. And it was nice to see him kind of get back in that contention final group on Sunday in a major. Didn't get it done, obviously, but to be there and basically be on the 16th tee with a very legitimate chance to win the golf tournament. Um, obviously didn't go well on 16, but to be there with three holes to go and a very legitimate chance to, go, to win the golf tournament, I think that bodes well for him with the next three majors because the tougher the golf course, the better he seems to play. I think he can play any golf course anywhere, anytime he's got, it's just such a well-rounded golf game. It's not, he's not a horse for course kind of guy. I feel like, I feel like he's wherever you plop him, he can figure it out. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I, I don't think we really need to harp too much on, on this. He had just a tremendously difficult double bogey on five. And then, yeah. um, you know, a, a triple on, on 16, you know, if he, if he doesn't do that, he's, he's probably winning the golf tournament um, or at least giving us a little more back nine drama that we had kind of, you know, wish we would have had. Um, but yeah, I think we just kind of have to look at it from perspective perspective of Xander Shoffley can, can play golf and he is an elite player and he's a top 10 player um, in the world. And with the U S open being held right in his backyard at, at Torrey Pines this year, like he grew up on that golf course. You got to think as long as the, you know, the moment, um, you know, and the stage isn't a little too big for him, then I think we're going to, we're going to see him there. I think that's something to be, I think it is a valid question though, right? Like he's played well in a lot of majors, but hasn't gotten it done. Like is the stage a little too big for him? Um, you know, and, and I don't know if we'll know that for, for probably a few more years, um, but he's put himself in an opportunity to win five, six majors at this point, um, you know, through the first few years of his career and, and hasn't gotten it done. So I think something to kind of think about and look forward upon is, you know, if he continues to put himself in these opportunities, does he continue to struggle kind of down the stretch? Yeah. Um, you know, it's definitely an intriguing, you know, kind of question. Yeah. And I think, I may be wrong here, but I think he's got five wins on tour and all of them were coming from behind. So the few times he's had a 54 hole lead, he has been able to get it done. And now, like you mentioned, I think it's six top fives in majors and there's like 13 career starts, which is incredible. Um, but like you said, it seems to always be a victim of the big number when he gets there. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, he's super young. So I think there's, it's all growing pains as long as you find a way to get that first one before it gets too out of hand. Like you can't get to female status with it, right? Like you got to get one under your belt to kind of just prove to yourself. I think just, you know, mentally, like just keep it out of your own head. Cause every, the media is always going to talk about that stuff. It's when it kind of leaks into your own thoughts and your own, you know, whatever you want to call it when you're out there, that it becomes a serious issue and it kind of builds on itself and snowballs. I think if he gets one within the next, let's call it two years, right? Seven majors. If he gets one, and I think he's more incapable of that. I know it sounds a little aggressive, but he's a top 10 player in the world and his game travels. It's not like he, they're going to throw a major at him where he's going to be kind of, uh, it doesn't fit him. Like he fits everywhere. So I think that's very doable for him. You know, if he stays healthy, I think he's got to get one. Um, if he wants to have like the epic career that I think he's got the talent to have, like, like hall of fame status type of career, I think he's got to get one soon just to prove to himself that it's, it's not the moment, right? Like get those demons out of there. Like, don't even let that become a, a narrative. Right. And just prove to yourself, prove to everybody else. Like you're, you're a guy and you're going to be here for, you know, the next 10, 15 years and, you know, rack up, you know, multiple major championships. I think, I think that's, I see him on that kind of career path where it's like hall of fame, handful of majors, maybe not a handful. It's kind of tough to win majors these days. It's, the fields are just so deep, so many good players, but I think you can win three, four majors, a sh shit ton of PGA tour events and just have a very, like very, very solid career, like hall of fame status. Yeah, no, I, I it's, I agree completely too. I just think from a ball striking perspective, from an overall short game and putting and he drives as good as anybody on tour, like, all the components are there. Um, you said you said it exactly correctly. His game travels. He's had success in the Open Championship. He's had success, um, you know, at the Masters. Obviously, like 
he's going to be there, um, you know, and, and I like kind of putting the cap on two years here. He's, he's in his probably 27, 28 at this point. Like I think um, kind of, you know, we got to see him win a, win a major. And I think if he wins a major, it could open up a door. It, it might open up a floodgate, honestly. Like I think, and I don't know if it means multiple majors in in a short time uh, span, but I, I put Xander in kind of a, a category of a two, three majors and, and 20 wins on the PGA tour in a, in a lifetime. Um, but if he doesn't do that, then he's more in that zero or one major and maybe 10 wins. Right. So like, and there's a big difference between that, you know, the, the first being, you know, a hall of fame career, like you're talking about and the latter being a tremendous PGA tour career, but realistically someone that people forget about in 10, 15 years. He's going to um, be one of those guys talk that like, if he does get talked about, it's like, Oh, what could have been like, he was so good. He just couldn't get it done. And like, you know, we're putting a lot on, you know, one, one bad swing on 16, but it's like, that's, I, I agree with you where I think if he gets one in the next two years, he's going to have a PGA tour season where he wins three or four times and, you know, racks up another major probably two years from whenever that happens. So like you said, I think the potential is there for like Hall of Fame status. It's just he's got to got to get the big one now, and then then just keep adding and adding and adding. I think if he lets it get away from him, it builds that narrative that you know, for better or worse, the media is going to talk about it nonstop. We're going to talk about it nonstop, and it, it whether you like it or not, it's going to play in your head. I mean, look at somebody like it's a pre- actually a pretty good transition into biggest disappointments here. Like, look at Rory McIlroy, like. They've been talking about him getting the green jacket at Augusta since 2010 when he snipe hooked one into somebody's backyard with a four shot lead on Sunday. And he's never been able to get back there since 2018 was the exception. He he had a chance against Patrick Reed and ultimately couldn't get it done on Sunday again, but he'll never, and he'll never admit it. He always kind of, he, he's very candid in the way he talks, but there's no way that the narrative of finishing his career grand grand slam and being able to get that green jacket, like that plays a role into his mindset every week he goes there because that's the first question he gets when he sits down at that podium is, are you ready to get the career grand slam this year? You know, it's like, you don't want it to get turned into that, you know, like Rory's a world-class player and, you know, unless something, unless he just retires right now. And even if he does retire right now, he's probably a hall of famer, right? He's got, is he at four? He four, uh, he's got four majors, so yeah. yeah. He'll be yeah, a Hall of he, Famer. He's got he's definitely yeah. 15 wins and a bunch of Euro Tour, all the Ryder Cup stuff. He's also, got the, he's also got the biggest, you know, margin of victory in a U.S. Open ever. True. So uh, he, beat, he beat people more than Tiger did at Pebble? Oh, no. Okay. You're right. But, it was, Tiger, but I mean, he did do something very similar. No, you're right. Tiger, well, you know? outside of Tiger, because Tiger beat – Tiger beat everyone by like 18 that week. <laughs> yeah. But like besides that, I think he – um <clears throat> He won, like, the, he, he won it by eight, I think, right? At Colonial? Uh, oh, no. It was at Dude. Congressional. It was at oh, Congressional. Congressional, yeah. He might have the lowest ever Kapar. U.S. Open score. Because like, yeah, I think he was like 15 right. under or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that, sound, that sounds more right. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, that's a guy that is ridiculously talented, and I think he's a, he's a great above Xander for sure when it comes to just overall talent. Like, he's a guy that seems to be really struggling with – the noise around him lately. I mean, I may be putting too much on. He might just be in a little bit of a rut. I mean, he's got family stuff going on where he just had a kid, you know, like that's a big life change where it's like that, but like he's been not been able to get it done in majors since 2014 when he won two that summer, when he won the PGA and the open and he's been, he backdoors top tens like nobody else just to make it seem like he had a good week, but he's never truly in contention in majors really since then. He was in the final group at Augusta 2018 with Patrick Reed, but missed a lot of putts on that front nine. and was very quickly out of that golf tournament. It seemed like, so it's just, you know, that's kind of that, that's just, that's, I guess like, that's my biggest disappointment is how it, I didn't expect Rory to win this week, but plus nine or 10, whatever he finished. That was just fucking hard to watch. He seemed very like, you could just see it every, cause he was in a featured group. I want to say on Friday, maybe it was Thursday, but like, you could just see it, man. He just knows. He's just like, he's just like, what the fuck, man? You know, like you can just see yeah. it in his like body language. He's like, why do I do this when I come here? You know, like what is wrong with me here? It's like, it's, it's in his head, you know, like he's 
overly talented. I, mean, I know he just yeah. switched swing coaches and he's probably working through some stuff there, but I don't know. I think he'll, he'll turn around too. I believe. I just think it like, that's, that's a very prime example of what the media and narratives can do to your mental game when it comes to golf. I mean, he won PGA tour events the last four or five years, he won the tour championship in 2017, whatever year that was, but it's like in the majors there's something in his brain right now. It's just not working, but I don't know. Who do you got for disappointments outside of Rory being the obvious one? Yeah. And just kind of the closed loop on that. It, you know, I think it was probably a perfect storm for Rory this week coming to Augusta, having had the the past struggles he has had the last 10 years. And then also new swing coach really struggling with the irons, right? Like he finds a way to hit like 350 bombs off the tee and it's whatever. But like when you're snipe hooking wedges and short yeah. irons, like, and he knows it quick. And like that, that club gets on his left shoulder quick on the way, on the way back. Yeah. Like, yeah, like, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like that, um, but you know, probably my biggest disappointment and I think we can kind of gloss over Bryson and DJ because they just, just a tough week. I mean, just a tough week and DJ, you know, made some bogeys coming in on, on Friday afternoon and, I think if he makes the cut, he probably back ends like a top 15 yeah. or something. He shoots like six, seven under total. And, um, you know, it looks okay. And he collects a six figure paycheck, but, <laughs> um, yeah. And Bryson's kind of a disaster. Like the guy just, guy just, just needs so to figure it out a little bit there. He's got no, he's, I th- I mean, maybe and this has been something that kind of gets talked about on Twitter a lot. It's like the, uh, the, not having the green books, like maybe that just like, you know, he's such a robot. Maybe that just throws him out of routine and he's fucked. You know, like he seems to be like the least, you know, he's the scientist, right? Everything's calculated, blah, 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 whatever. Throw that little routine out, that little wrench in his routine. I mean, he still reads the putts, but it's like, you know, not his book first and then blah, 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 whatever. Like, I think that might, I mean, he's as much as we like to bash him, he's probably one of the hardest working guys out there and takes on challenges like more than anybody else and like he'll find a way to figure it out but it's got to play a little bit of a role I feel like it's just just one thing that he can't control and he's all about having as much control as he can he just looks so uncomfortable out there you know it's like he's he's posing on irons that are airmailing greens or way short he's off by like 15 yards at times like just doesn't just not and like it's from fairways too I'm not you know picking stuff coming out of rough catching flyers like that happens but it seems just he's it's not comfortable for whatever reason. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely, but kind of what I was, what I was getting at as far as the biggest disappointment, someone who shot even worse than Rory McIlroy did this week, Patrick Cantley. One of my picks. Yeah. Str- not a, not a great pick from you um, on that one, but just there was nothing in his golf game the last six months that told us that he was going to shoot what he did this week. Yeah. Um, like, what, the what was he 11, 11 over? <laughs> yeah. I think it was 11. It was like, dude, what? I think it was eight on um, Thursday. Like he was, it came out of the gates and was just done. I was like, I literally was, I like watching through the uh, like feature groups or whatever. He wasn't in a feature group on Thursday. And then to just go check the leaderboard at some point. I'm like, wait, what the, f-? like, what the hell happened? Like, how are you plus eight? Like I was, that one baffles me. I really, like you said, nothing of his golf game in the last six months, his track record here, all that, like nothing adds up to what we got this week. Fluke weeks happen. Golf is a very difficult game. It's very quickly to get down and like, you know, get a couple bad breaks. You start compounding mistakes because you, you're pushing it, forcing it, whatever. Um, but yeah, that was, that was just unexplainable. I was, that one was, out of all of them, that was probably the most surprising, I think, with how bad it was and how out of trend it was. I mean, Rory hasn't been playing well for a little while now. Bryson and DJ, like, yeah, they weren't contending, but they weren't, you know, plus 11 by any means, you know, like, <laughs> just different. Yeah, and and similar, similar, like, similarly confusing, I think. Justin Thomas, like, what happened to him on Saturday afternoon after the restart? Um was was almost as confusing as the the Patrick Cantley overall Thursday and Friday, right? Like Hideki come out comes out and absolutely dominates on Saturday afternoon, and and we see Justin Thomas kind of fall off the rails and make a a triple bogey on thirteen, and 
don't get me wrong. A triple bogey happens on 13 occasionally if you get a bad break or, you know, you hit one in the water off the tee, but he just made a mess around the green. And for, for someone who is such an elite pitcher of the golf ball. And, you know, when I think of who has some of the best technique and just Mm -hmm. like, who, who would I expect to get up and down from a tight lie all day long? Justin Thomas is, is very much at the top of that, um, that list. So to see him flub shots and lose his temper, like kind of, you know, lose his control and, you know, like, don't get me wrong. He gets fiery at times, but usually yeah. he figures it out and usually it motivates him. Right. And he was not motivated by that triple bogey. There was no oh, really? like will to continue after that. It was very, um, I mean, to, to summarize that hole, he hit it in the trees, right? The, like he's got that weird, like closed down hook three wood driver shot that he's been playing lately that he, you know, kind of patented at the, the at Sawgrass when he won, like, got this just smother hook (laughs) that he plays with the driver that just rolls forever, which is perfect for like 10 and 13 at Augusta. And it didn't hook on uh, Saturday and he's in the trees. Actually, it's a pretty good punch shot. He kind of goes up by the crowd and hooks it down that hill. He's got a 70 yard wedge into that green. And I know, you know, I want to say the pin was on that. It was tucked, you know, on Saturday. I feel like it, it not wasn't in the Sunday spot, but it was hugging the water and he, dumps it in there and then like you said just throws up on himself I was like what like I, like you said it's just so out of character and it's like he went from I think before that before the delay I think he was at five Rose was at six and Matsuyama was at six or maybe seven uh maybe six because he went off post restart so he might not even have been in the lead yet but I think Rose was in the lead at six him him Jordan and a bunch of other guys were at five and it was turning out to be like Saturday was awesome it was like here we go. And then that, you know, the, the break happens and the restart and all of a sudden he drops to minus one and Hideki's at minus 11 and now he's out of the tournament. It's like, what the hell happened in those, you know, the two hours It's just, and it like, he's one of those guys, like you say, he's fiery. Right. So he, and like, has that, he like, he had that look in his eye on Saturday where he was like, like very Sunday at TPCS where he's like, I have absolute control over my golf ball. I'm playing aggressive. Like, I know exactly what I'm doing. Like, here we go. And, like, he did it for the first, you know, 10, 11 holes. He played really well. And then all of a sudden it just fell off the rail so fast. Like, he just – he gets, like, in that mode, it seems like, where he's just locked in and you can see it on him. Like, when Rory gets that little bop in his step, right, walking down the fairways, we haven't seen it in a little while. But, like, you can just tell that they're, like, like get me to my next shot so I can just execute it perfectly make a birdie next hole, execute, execute, birdie next. Mm -hmm. Like they just kind of get that rolling. And he seemed like he had that. And the restart just absolutely threw him out of that. And he just, like you said, I think he made that triple and then completely checked out of the golf tournament. He was like, what the fuck just happened? Fuck this restart. I can't believe I just did that. Like mad at everything. And then it was just done. It it sucks because that like that was my pick to win. I thought and I was keeping an eye on him all week. He wasn't in the lead by any means, but he was kind of right there lurking and just, he needed, I was waiting for him to have that nine hole stretch where he goes off and it just, he, that restart happened and then he went the other way and I was like, shit, <laughs> but yeah, yeah that, that was tough. Yeah. Tough, tough to see that happen, especially kind of being in, being in prime position to, to make a push on Saturday afternoon. And I like Justin Thomas's chances down uh, you know, on the back nine on Sunday, he's kind of had a little bit of a, a killer instinct the last yeah. couple of years. Um, but, you know, biggest disappointments, you know, you know, Patrick Hanley and JT, two of the best dressers on the PGA tour. Very well. I think some weird I only, about the JT, I, though. teal pants on Thursday. You see those things? Those are wild. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> he's wearing a lot of Grayson stuff because his buddies yeah. are his yeah. buddies own Grayson. But I only bring that up because. And I feel like we're going back to what we talked about in the 2020 masters, but there is something in the water in these, (laughs) I don't know what meetings are happening, um, you know, at Nike at under armor, even at Uniqlo for Adam Scott, like what goes on at the masters that tells us that we need to create these ridiculous patterns, put them on t-shirts, put them on shirts, put them on hats and make our players, you know, 
wear the same outfit. Like I understand the scripting and like, you know, sometimes we get people with the same outfit, but like when everyone has to wear a terrible pink shirt (laughs) at the same time, or everyone has to wear those like weird lines or terrible, like camouflage hats, it just makes it even like, I can get over it when one person dresses bad, but when a, when a company like Nike or Under Armour does it and you have tons of players in the field, you can't get, you can't get past it and you can't avoid it. Who is kind of like, you know, talk on Nike. Cause I know, you know, we all, we all like Nike and, you know, we wore some Nike stuff in college and things like that. And I mean, they have solid stuff. I just don't know really what, what comes of it when it comes to the masters and, and what they, they put out there for scripting. Yeah. Somebody, for with the at the powers above whether it's augusta i don't know somebody needs to put a stop to this because it's fucking ridiculous like it's like they're trying to see what they can get away with like it's that bad like poor tommy fleetwood made an ace on thursday i think it was yeah worst shirt of all time he looks like he has the continents or like a a, a murder scene where they outline the body in chalk on the pavement that's what his shirt looked like it's like what the fuck kind of shirt is that like you said nike has so much good stuff tiger woods wears it all the time and he when they come out with that bullshit he usually wears a toned down version of it because he's like absolutely not i'm not wearing that fucking shirt but like it was like what the fuck is that like the 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 and the Tony Fina had it on too with the highlighter shirt. He had the lines everywhere too. It's like, what are we doing? Like Paul Casey, yeah. that poor bastard too. <laughs> what I, <laughs> He's I think the I worst te- dress player on the golf course every single day. <laughs> this week. I think like- I, I think I texted the group. I was like, Tony F- Fina looks like a tennis ball right now. <laughs> yeah, tennis ball. That was it. Yeah, because the lines. It's like, dude, Paul and I put it on Twitter and on the Bogey Brew story on Instagram. Like, my goodness, was his hats awful this week. Like, I don't know what the design was. The shirts weren't any better. It was like, what are we doing? Like, Brooks Kepka usually keeps it pretty simple. He looked like the Pink Panther on Thursday. Like, what was that hat? He had gray and black on and then a neon pink hat. Like, what are we doing? Like, it just – and, like, Rory, too, usually, again, another guy that he kind of – they'll give him the scripting and he'll be like, no, 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 I'll do this. Like he'll tweak it a little or make it fit him a little bit better. The Thursday outfit with like the Royal blue, almost purple kind of weird colored hat, black shirt, white pants. I was like, what the hell is that? Like just color coordinating was just terrible. Like Nike needs to like, they should be banned from dressing at Augusta. They, all their people that they sponsor should be able to wear whatever they want next year at Augusta because they've been so bad the last two years. Like, I just, there's no explanation for it. Like this is your Super Bowl, right? For merch, because you're getting so many people to watch that, you know, are, you know, fair weather fans for lack of a letter, lack of a better word that don't watch golf all the time. They're not going to see the great outfits you normally put out and they're going to watch this and they're going to go to the stores and buy it if it looks good, but it looks like shit. And you have like, I just, oh, it was like every day they came out with new shirts or new scripting, whatever you want to call it. And I was like, Oh my God. Like, like, I can't believe they're doing it another day, like another day. It's like, I just don't know. Like you said, I don't know what's in the water at those meetings. I don't know who's making those decisions, but they absolutely need to retire or be fired depending on what age they are. And just like, my goodness, it was it's yeah, like if, laughable. It's like, they're trying to get away with it right in front of our face. Like somebody needs to hold them accountable. <laughs> like, Yeah. If, if the designers are of age, put them in a home. That's all. I <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I don't. I don't need to. I don't think we need to talk too much about Under Armour just because it was mostly it's just Jordan. the hat. You just it's, can't have the full write out on the hats. It's just weird. <laughs> it's Jordan and and Matt Fitz. So, Dave Cherry, if you're listening to this, talk to someone. Send an email. If just if, the hats, you're, Jerry. if you personally don't want to send it, give us an email and we'll send an anonymous <laughs> email. Um, you know, we're happy to get canceled. The but, shirts uh, were good though. They always make really good. They always do blue, but it always looks good. Outside little, of like a dots. outside of like a rogue like line on the sleeve. Yeah, that, that was like... weird on on Friday or Saturday. Jordan had the navy shirt on and then just like rogue line on his on his bicep. I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was a little off. Um, and then I just I, I feel like we talk about this way too much, but it's it's becoming an issue. Adam Scott, the guy. I don't get it you know, has 
such an opportunity to wear great clothes. Uniqlo is a a great company. I think I believe they're English. They're not just they're not like a golf company. They're just like an overall athletic leisure, you know, nice clothing company. And we cannot get him to wear colors that make sense. We're getting like weird beiges and you know tans and get him with his you know he loves he's a he's a big blue hat black shirt guy oh it's terrible Um, never matches his hat with the rest of his outfit it's like what are you doing man like my roommate does not watch golf very often (laughs) and we were i had it on saturday morning watching feature group coverage through the app or masters.com or whatever and he sits on the couch next to me we're having coffee or whatever and he goes, why does this guy look like he's a safari tour guy? Like, that's how bad Adam Scott is dressed. And he's, like we talked about last week, one of the best looking dudes on tour. Like you just said about his sponsor. It's like, I don't understand who lets him walk out of the house like that. Like, if I put that outfit on and I was going to play golf myself at, like, a local muni, nobody cares about, not Augusta National, like, my girlfriend or my roommates would be like, dude, what are you wearing? You know what I'm saying? Like, why does nobody say that to him? I don't get it. He had... <laughs> and so that was saturday light tan brown on the bottom so the safari look sunday he just flip-flopped it it was brown on top and tan khakis on the bottom i was like again it's like he's trying to get away with it wait nobody's calling him out and he's like i can't believe you idiots are letting me wear this you know what i'm saying it's like i don't know maybe like maybe am i just like out of touch with like golf fashion style like i don't get it it's like it's so so bad it's like maybe that's why Patrick Reed left Nike. Maybe he's like, I'd rather dress myself. You guys are terrible. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he's got CBDMD now as a sponsor, but he can kind of wear whatever apparel he wants as long as he slaps that on it. Maybe that's why he left because he's like, I'm not wearing the brown, like, <laughs> like checkered, whatever bullshit yeah. shirt you're giving me at Augusta. Like, I'm not wearing that again next year. I feel like an idiot. I, I, I think about my outfit while I'm trying to win the Masters. It was, yeah. Bad. It's just, yeah, it's just a tough, it. it's just a tough scene from some of the, the biggest and most profitable and most successful, you know, apparel companies in the entire world that this is what they produce at the, like you're saying, the top grossing and the, the most viewed um, golf event of the entire year. So just looking, just looking for people, for them to get a little better. I'm not, we're not asking for much. And I think the bar is set so low after last year's masters and this year, I think we kind of just stomped on it and pushed it even further, um, you know, below the ground. So they're just getting, they're reinventing the wheel. You're just getting crazy. Like look at what Tiger won when he wore, when he won in 2019, solid colors, like a pink and gray, a Navy and gray, a black and black, like a black and gray and the black and red, like keep it solid colors, tight fitting, good fitting stuff. It's all people want. Like, I don't need the fucking weird lines that, I don't even know what the purpose of those lines were. It looked like the outline of continents. Like it just, oh, I mean, yeah. like, I don't know. It's no, fucking ridiculous. No, we're, it's so bad that we didn't even get an opportunity to talk about how poorly Travis Matthew clothes are for John Rom because. Oh, oh I, my goodness. It's tough to watch because he just sweats through them. I and I love, Tra- I love Travis Matthew it. stuff, but it makes me think like if I was playing on tour, I couldn't have Travis Matthew. It's like, not, it's just, like, it's not comfortable enough. It's, it's yeah. It's, it's more like you wear it to lunch or work or like, I'd rather wear that with a pair of jeans. Honestly, yeah, exactly. I would say like, yeah. wear it with a pair. It's like, it's a different material. Like it's, it's super comfortable and it looks awesome, but for playing a golf tournament, walking 18 holes, it just, you're going to sweat through it unless you wear black. It's just, that's what it is. It's just, and I fucking said it when he signed his deal at the beginning of the season, I was like, I don't know. Like I have Travis Matthew shirts. I can't wear them when I play golf. Cause I was like, I just, I sweat through them and I look like an idiot. And like, he wears that like pinkish red one on Sundays with the gray every time. And by the time you see him in the highlights, I mean, shout out to him back end top five, like you read about even par, even par, even par six hunter to sneak into a T five. Um, and like, you know, shout out to him for playing that well, right. Like three days after having a kid, pretty impressive stuff to be honest. But like, the f- you it's just it doesn't look good it just like imagine holding a trophy up and you're pitting you know like you just like obviously they all sweat up there like augusta is no joke to walk i'm not saying like don't sweat like obviously like it just happens but like 
Travis Matthew, it isn't it. Like, I don't. Who's the other big Travis Matthew guy? Cantlay. Cantlay is a big one. I mean, there's plenty of guys he out there. He wears all black all the time, right? Now yeah. you know why. He's because he's like, I'm gonna sweat, so I gotta wear all black. Like I've done that game before too. It's just like, it's he it doesn't it doesn't work. Oh, before we move on, we actually glossed over. See Wu Kim on Friday putting with the five foot for six <laughs> holes, three back of the lead on Friday at the Masters, and you snap your putter on 15. Didn't try that was shot. pretty incredible. Huh? Yeah, didn't. I don't think he dropped a shot either. Two putted all the way in. Yeah, almost made one on 16 too. It actually looked pretty good. I thought I was going to make it. He like stuffed one to that top right one on the shelf and had 12 feet and kind of burned it right by the edge. But he was he was playing imagine. well. He was playing well Saturday too, and then I think I texted the group, and then he fell off the earth. Yeah, yeah. We usually do that. Whoever texts the group about a certain player, it's like, oh wait, never mind. An hour later. <laughs> but yeah, I mean mentally can't imagine where he was to be he I think he was four and Rose was seven and snapped the putter on 15 green and then (laughs) I love to shout out to CBS for the coverage of this because they did a good job or ESPN whoever it was they didn't they every time he had to putt the rest of the way they made sure they, they showed him they didn't like let him get away with it they didn't make me look too hard to find the footage of him putting with a five wood at Augusta National but it was a sight to see and it's not like he was, you know, if Cantley did it, I would have been like, all right, makes sense. But see Wu out there snapping clubs, three off the lead at Augusta is pretty, uh, pretty interesting headspace he must have been in. I wonder what he did. You think he went to the Scotty Cameron truck or you think he went in the shop and grabbed one? Uh, I'm my thinking is that they had a putter ready for him, you know, when he got off the 18th, when he got off the 18th green, they had like four putters ready for him with like a similar head on it. It was like, hey, which one do you want? And yeah. He probably yep. putted for an hour and at the end of the day and then took one with him. Yep. So, you know, perks of, perks of being a tour player and, and, you know, perks of playing at the Masters. But speaking of uh, Siwoo Kim, I, I like Siwoo Kim this week. We'll transition into kind of, um, you know, the golf course and the tournament this week just briefly and, and give our picks here. But RBC Heritage at, at Harbor Town in, in Hilton Head, South Carolina a tough spot after the masters every year. I think it's a great golf course. It's a fun tournament. Um, it's a cool location. Um, definitely would suggest people that, that love the game of golf. I think going to this tournament or spending some time in Hilton head is, is really a fun place and have had an opportunity to go a couple of times and, and really have enjoyed my time there. Um, but it's an interesting, it's a Pete Dye golf course. It's right on the water. It's super tight. Um, so we really kind of, it kind of lends itself to shorter hitters often kind of being the favorites in this, but with that being said, right, we've got some studs in the field and probably don't have to look too far from the people playing the best golf in the world. Um, you know, I think sometimes when we go to these different golf courses, we kind of think, oh, who's kind of the horse for the course when in reality, Hey, the person who's playing the best of the top player in the field likely has the best shot of winning the golf tournament. There's a reason that they create odds and there's a reason those people are so good at their job. Um, you know, those are the people that are most likely to be there on Sunday afternoon, but mm-hmm. um, at Harbor town, like we kind of were talking about Siwoo Kim there, Pete Dye specialist. None of us are going with him this week, but uh, if you can get a good, if you can get a good odd on odds on Siwoo Kim to maybe have a top 10 or a top five, I like that pick as well, but I'll dive into my picks. Someone who's been playing great as of late, Mm -hmm. Brian Harmon, T2, T3, or whatever it was at the players, and then played well at the Masters again, was top 10, Um, really was kind of hanging in there for the majority of um, Friday and was was lurking around a little bit on Saturday, I think. He might have got a little pissed off when when Joey said, you know, he just wanted to keep an eye on him out there, and he wasn't going to pick for the Masters. So it fueled the fire for the first two days. I think he was second after Friday, right, or maybe third or something like that. Yeah, he just yes. kind of ran out. He just ran out of offense. He doesn't hit it long enough to be able to make, like the par fives aren't automatic for him there, right? Exactly. I mean, two is, but eight and fifteen and even thirteen, like for a less two, he's got to hit like a slice versus a hook around that corner. So. They're just not automatic. I think he just kind of ran out of the offense. But again, like you said, playing really, really solid golf and play good at the uh, match play too. He's a I, I would be in this golf course. Like he's a little bit of a shorter hitter. I think he's 
definitely, I mean, as long as he's not like, you know, hung over from Augusta, you know, it's always a big emotional league for everybody. As long as he's, you know, right back at it and like ready to roll, I'd be surprised for to see him not in the mix. Yeah. And a, a guy who is, so he won, he won at a, he won the Wells Fargo when it was played at Eagle something out, you know, in like the Wilmington, North Carolina era really plays well on kind of like some more seaside, like with some really good firm Bermuda. And I don't know, I think he's a sea Island guy too. And I think that all kind of transitions as well. Like when you practice on kind of that, like seaside Bermuda, that is Bermuda is thick and it's, and it's overseeded and it's tough to chip on and you know, it, it plays different, but there's a, there's a different type of it when it's right by the ocean and it's thick and it's even more so, you know, kind of someone who practice and plays on it every single day has a, has a, a big time advantage. So I think even more so from a, from a course condition standpoint, Brian Harmon, uh, Brian Harmon's a good pick and I'll definitely, you know, be throwing some money on him for, for a top 10 and, you know, maybe something a little on a, an outright winner. We'll yeah. Just, yeah. I mean, you got to tease it a little bit if you're going to, if you're going to pick it and put it out there on, on the internet as a, as a big time pick, you go for it last week. Right. I called out Will Zell, uh, Zell Torres and said he wasn't going to play well at the masters. I was going to fade him. Um, so you know you're not you're not always gonna you're not always gonna have a great pick you're gonna have some hot takes and that's what it is but you got to learn to roll with it and i'll give uh i'll give joey's pick speaking of will zalatoris big willie z that's where he's going right in the train um you know we kind of refer to joey as the z man sometimes Mm -hmm. this is this is big willie z you know and you know (laughs) it makes sense so just like that common connection. And I don't think Kyrdek is in the, in the field this week at, uh, at Hilton head. So if he's not, if, if he is in the field, then we're going to have to talk to Joey because then that's just the lack of, you know, overall commitment to your just guy. disrespect. Honestly, is what it is. Yeah. So I think, <laughs> but kind of rolling, kind of rolling with Zalatoris and, you know, I don't blame him. He's been a <laughs> he's been an elite player on tour as of late, and would expect him to to play well. Yeah, but, no rat this week. No yeah, rat. no, yeah, no rat this week. So that's that's a tough play. I think he's he's probably back back and forth between the European tour. Kind of a wild schedule. The guy gets into European the gets into European tour events, gets into PGA tour events, plays Corn Ferry and opposite tour events sometimes. Plays Monday qualifiers like. I don't know what kind of status the guy has, um, but definitely in, interested to kind of see where he he fits in the reshuffle here. But wh- who are your picks, Matt? And then also give us Eric's pick as well. Yeah, so I'm going uh, Matt Fitz this week. I think he played pretty solid at Augusta. He didn't play great by any means, but I think he was around that t- like top 20. He was, you know, hanging around. It like wasn't an abysmal week and. I think, you know, kind of like we said, I think this golf course is really, again, it's in a tough spot right after Augusta, but it's a really cool golf course and a good change of pace. Like they don't try and do anything crazy with this. Like all you hear about is the distance and like expanding golf courses, stretching them out, all this shit. And this one just like, they're like, nope, we're keeping our distance. It's tight as shit out here. Like ha- if you, if you drive it perfectly, you know, wedges all day have at it, but it's hard enough around there. Like there's just so much shit going on that it's, tight windy like short whatever i think it just fits his his game he, he doesn't blast it but he's super consistent usually putts really well too he had an okay week on the greens at augusta but i'm rolling with him and then eric's going with another guy that kind of actually the games kind of remind me of fits but cam smith not the best golf swing i've ever seen but he knows he's a grinder man he's a bulldog like there's a brief second there on Friday where he was in the lead at seven under after eagling 15, I think it was, or 13. And then, no, it was 13 because then on 15, eagled, he like an eight. <laughs> he, he, he eagled 15 on Thursday. On Thursday, yeah, hit it like a foot, right? Yeah. So another guy that he plays really good, he seems to always be in the mix. He doesn't like win a ton. I can't remember the last tournament he won. Maybe the, whatever that second one is in Hawaii every year. Yeah, he won, he won. So, yeah, he won the Sony open. Yep. Sony. Yeah. So he's a bulldog though. He's a competitor. He grinds it out. He plays well when it gets a little difficult and like frustrating for players and plays good on firm places too. I don't know how firm or fast um, that 
uh, Harbor Town plays, but it is like a difficult one and how tight it is. And you have to be like patient. And I think that kind of fits his alley. So Eric's going with Cam Smith. I think it's a good pick. I, I mean, Cam Smith is a bulldog. I, I think he's president's cup problem, but I mean, we usually do all right in those, but like, he's, he's going to be like the leader. Like he's going to be the, the Ian Poulter of the Ryder cup. I think he's going to be that for the international side for the years to come. Yeah, for sure. I like that pick. And I like it even more. I saw, I think it was PGA tour tweeted out um, or one of their correspondents. <laughs> he was out at Harbor town. He had a fishing pole in hand. Yeah, fishing um, I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of cool. And, you know, I really, I appreciate kind of getting a little perspective on, you know, the PGA tour players, he was out, he was getting his work in. He was, you know, whether he played 18 or nine or just hit balls or practice, whatever, like he was trying to find a way to get a, get away. But Harbor town is such a unique place. It's like, it's kind of like its own little Island within Hilton head Island itself too. So like, he's probably not leaving the, the clubhouse or kind of the resort area um, all week long. So, you know, like, what does he do? He, he goes and he, he works on his game and then he goes and grabs a fishing pole and he's like walking back into the pro shop, like just a kind of a cool place. And um, I think it, it speaks again to the point, right? If you get an opportunity to go down to, to Hilton head and maybe watch this tournament or play some golf, I think it's a cool place. And, and, a place that a lot of people would enjoy, but, you know, looking forward to, to watching a little golf this weekend. I think the masters is definitely a draining week as far as how much golf you watch and how much you consume. Yeah. So I think this weekend will definitely be one. I'll definitely watch and kind of follow along, but it's going to be one where, where I take a step back a little bit and yeah. you know, kind of, you know, I'm going to definitely, I'm going to play golf on, on Saturday and Sunday. And Eric's actually, coming down to Pinehurst on, on Sunday afternoon. So looking forward to, to spending a little time with him at the resort and, and messing around a little bit. So, you know, also looking forward to kind of producing a little content and we put it up on the Instagram story here on Wednesday and this, this pod's going to drop on Thursday, but we're, we're looking to do a Pinehurst themed giveaway here. So, so slide into our DMS on, on Twitter, or Instagram, and let us know what you want to have in that, uh, in that kind of grab bag or goodie bag, you know, I think it's logical to maybe have a hat or some ball markers, but you know, I, th- I think we're open. The Pinehurst pro shop has absolutely everything. So anything that you would want logoed from, from Pinehurst, I'm here for six weeks. We're going to get some good stuff. We're going to do some good, go- some, some good giveaways. So slide into our DMS, let us know what you want. Uh, again, furthermore, like Joey put out another, video uh, a swing of of our guy big al today and <laughs> give a little insight on on a very good golf swing and, and hoping for a comeback what what was kind of your thought on that golf swing i thought i thought it had a little speed and a little pop which i hadn't seen you know maybe since 2016 or so <laughs> yeah i mean big al swings always look good i think it's always just been a timing thing for him where he's releasing a little different than where his impact spot is like it just kind of shuts that face on him and he gets that left miss going and gets in trouble, but swing looked good. I mean, like Joey said in the, you know, in his little breakdown, like good takeaway, very on plane and like explode, like you said, explodes at that ball. Like it's a short swing, but like it, it's, it looks really good on camera. I mean, you know, only he can know how good it feels or, you know, looks when he's actually playing or whatever, but I, that was the first thing I commented. I said, come back season question mark. <laughs> it's like, let's go big Al. Like the swing looks good. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, to your point, like, right, Joey's got that stuff going out on Instagram. Masters Week, we put a bunch of stuff out there. We're working on getting, like Mikey said, they're going to be at Pine. He's at Pine for six weeks. We're going to have new content from all around that area of, like, you know, drills to work on. You do some video of him and Eric maybe playing the cradle on Sunday or playing whatever course they're playing. And, you know, Joey actually stopped there on his drive up. We got an, we're going to do an episode next week, I think of like kind of breaking down Joey's drive from Florida, New Hampshire and his golf stops along the way. Cause I know he played some pretty cool courses. So lot to, uh, lot to come content wise, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, you know, the podcast itself, adding a couple more things and, you know, just really looking forward to, uh, you know, you're in Pinehurst, Joey's back up in New Hampshire. So some new stuff coming out of there, maybe a lot of stuff coming from bogey proof. Yeah, no, I, I feel like kind of just uh, to loop it all in together too. I think, we're finding our stride with the, with the podcast here after really going, going pretty strong here for, for four or five months um, and, and kind of understanding, you know, what we want to do. And 
we just need people's feedback. I think the listeners out there, tell us, tell us what you guys want to hear. I think we're trying to get more and more personal, uh, you know, on these podcasts and kind of give some, some more insightful things and, and, and connect kind of tour golf to, to kind of the everyday golfer um, sort of situation and how all that, how, how all that works. And, but I think our brains, you know, often, often kind of lead to, to this pro golf spectrum. And, and we kind of, we focus on that because we watch a lot of golf and that's the majority of what we consume, but really we need, we want people's inputs on, you know, what they want from us. And we're happy to, you know, go out there and, and do some unique episodes. We don't have to talk about pro golf every single week. We can, we can dive into some other topics that, that are worth diving into. And I think we also, we really want to talk more about food and booze and travel. Like, I think those are, those are things that are really important to us and kind of with the summer coming up and, and COVID laying down a little bit, um, lucky enough to get that first dose of the vaccine and going to get my second one by the end of the month here. Yep. We got Ireland kind of looking like it's possibly going to happen here in August. Like a, a lot of really exciting things to, to happen kind of within our own personal lives, but our listeners out there are doing similar things or doing more exciting things. Right. So, you know, slide into our DMS and, and, and let us know, give us a phone call if you know us personally and, or send us a text and say, Hey, this is what I got going on. Let's, let's chat about it. Come on the show. And um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to, to do that and us to kind of divert into different paths that are, that are really interesting and create kind of a, a more diverse portfolio of content. Um, kind of like we talk about, you know, producing something a little bit different across every feed um, and really giving the listener what they want. Absolutely. Shit, I made a sandwich last week. I was like, what? <laughs> like, I'm not a chef. I don't know what I'm doing, but, you know, we're trying to mix it up. I made a, I made a quick pimento cheese sandwich last week. For, and for all, all, <laughs> all I got to say is the sandwich looked fantastic, but the photography skills <laughs> behind the sandwich were as elite as it gets. Like, I can't, I can't take full credit for those. I literally went to my girlfriend. I was like, can you take pictures of this so it looks good? <laughs> I literally was like, all right, I'm going to, here's my plan. I was like, I'm going to, Put it all together, like lay out the ingredients, make it look nice. I'm gonna mix it all up. Let's take a picture of that. I'm gonna make the sandwich, place it all nice. Like she's got, you know, the newer iPhone or whatever. So I was like, just make this look good. Send me the final product and put it on Instagram. So I can't take credit for that, but shout out to my girlfriend. She did a very good job taking the picture. So it definitely did add to the effect, the impact, I should say, on Instagram. Yeah, and I and I I will do hand, I will hand up. You know, Joey and I got out there at on Mid Pines, and I am not someone who takes a whole lot of videos or photos on the golf course. Mm -hmm. So I think we missed, we missed the boat a little bit, not sending out some photos of mid pines, which is an absolutely tremendous golf course. And Joey and I had a great day out there. We had a kick-ass caddy. Mm -hmm. I was taking it deep on the front nine. We were having a blast. Um, but I think, you know, we need to be a little bit better about that too and kind of document our, some of the things that we do and, and you know, hand up and I, I will try to do a better job as uh, you know, the remainder of these six weeks kind of comes to a close here in Pinehurst. And we got a whole summer ahead of, of a lot of great golf, a lot of, a lot of good food and booze and some fun travel trips. So Mr. Fontaine, always good seeing you and, and cheers. Absolutely. Cheers.